Thank you, Kevin. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned in our introduction, this is the last of our Wednesday midweek Lenten services for the season. We've come a long way, but next week is Holy Week, so there'll be no Wednesday service next week. We will have Thursday, Monday, Thursday service at 12.10 at 7 p.m. again, and a Good Friday service next Friday at 7 p.m. as well. Please certainly join us for those two services, but no Wednesday next week. We're finishing up today on looking at the fourth of five topics we've been looking at through this series, the Serving Challenge, the five aspects of serving, of serving as as Pastor Zender has written for us in this book, and all of it's based on Philippians chapter 2 that we've been looking at the entire month, but I'll just read it again. This is starting with verse 5, Philippians 2. St. Paul says, In your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And from that statement, Pastor Zender has identified four, four different serving aspects, four of the five that we will look at in this series, availability, attitude, action, and today, ability. And if you were here on Sunday, if you're here over the weekend, you heard Pastor Lee talk about ability, how God has equipped every one of us with unique abilities, unique gifts. Every one of us has a different set of gifts designed to reach different people in different points in life. We're all unique when it comes to our ability set. And of course comes from Christ. That Jesus alone is unique in his ability to save us by his death on the cross. That Jesus is the only person ever to be without sin in this world. Therefore he is uniquely abled to go to the cross and die for our sins. But all these things that we've been talking about, these four topics especially, remind me of something. Remind me of something we've actually been doing for a year and a half now. It's these terms, gather, grow, go, and generosity is a part of our all-in series. Our all-in series has been our, our two-year stewardship initiative. It be, actually began le, uh, November in 2022, but it's all of 2023, all of 2024 right now. Gather, Grow, Go, and All In has been guiding us as a staff as we consider what we're going to do as a church, especially sermon series. And I found it very interesting as I've been working on these sermons how closely those four terms and their sets of terms are related. I mean, in order to gather, you have to be willing. You have to be available to gather together, right? So availability and gather are connected Grow. We don't just grow in any human worldly wisdom. No, we study God's word. And as we study God's word, God uses the Holy Spirit to make us more Christ-like, to have a more Christ-like attitude about the world that he has created and redeemed. So grow and attitude go together. And then action and go, going, I mean, those are just synonyms of each other. So I think they go together quite obviously. And then this week is ability, and I paired that with generosity because, frankly, and I think this, I got this from Pastor Lee's sermon on Sunday. For us to have an ability, we have to be generous with that ability or it just sits idle. That we have to be, have a mindset of generosity for our abilities, the things that you, God has uniquely gifted us. But as I look at those sets, and maybe you realize those sets are very similar, maybe you have a snicker in your, the back of your mind, oh, look at that, we're just copying each other, or... We're, we're uncreative. There may be Pastor Zender stole from us or we stole from Pastor Zender. I don't think either is the case. But I, as I recognize the similarity of these two sets of terms, ability, attitude, action, ability, gather, grow, go, generosity, the wisdom of a mentor of mine named Pastor Dan rang in my head. Pastor Dan was a mentor of mine, so it was 20 years ago now. But he said, and I remember, I, it's not an exact quote because I never wrote it down at the time, but he said at the time, if, he thought if he saw multiple independent people across Christianity seemingly come up with the same idea at the same time, that it was a pretty sure bet that the Holy Spirit was guiding the activity of the church. That rather than see some weird duplication of ideas here, Pastor Dan would rather see God directing it. That God was guiding us towards this insight as he directed Pastor Zender as he wrote his book towards these same insights. That these are aspects of serving one another. 
And that's actually a lot of the sort of wisdom I got from Pastor Dan. Like I mentioned, I met him 20 years ago. I actually met him as I came off a very bad breakup in my life. Long before I met my wife, and I say that importantly because my daughter's up front here. But it was a bad breakup, and not only did I lose the woman in the relationship, I lost our social group. We had a shared social group, and they all went with her, and I was kind of left alone, kind of restarting life in my mid-20s. And I walked into Trinity Lutheran Church in Lyle, Illinois, where my daughter was baptized, eventually, and I had just been there a couple of times. I wasn't a member. I knew the church existed. I had attended a couple of worships. But kind of in my, my meandering through life at this point, I, I went in and I sat down ultimately in Pastor Dan's office. And I looked at him and I remember saying to him, I'm here to get involved. That's what I told him. I'm here to get involved, which is availability, of course. And... Dan took me up at my word. Pastor Dan took me up. He got me involved in things. But more than that, more than that, he involved himself. He engaged with me in a one-on-one mentoring relationship that went on for years. Years. And at first, he and I talked about kind of the fallout of the broken relationship and what to do with my life next. And then we talked about my life as a Christian because while I would have claimed I was a Christian 20 years ago, I certainly didn't act like it. And so he... He taught me discipleship, what it meant to be a Christ follower. And then after that, we started talking about becoming a professional church worker because to that point in my life, I had never thought about being a professional church worker. So I credit a lot of my even being here today to Pastor Dan and his mentorship a long time ago. And really what I saw in Dan was these four attitudes on display or these four aspects, because he had an attitude for caring for me. Because like I said, I, was, I wasn't a member. I was a random guy off the street that he hadn't met before. And yet he didn't say, well, you're not a member, I don't care. He said, and he must have thought, hey, there's a guy who needs my help. And that was his attitude towards everybody that walked in. As I watched him over the years, no matter who walked up to him, he would engage with them. He had an attitude towards caring for everybody. And like I said, we met for years. He made himself available. And Trinity Lutheran Church at the time was a very busy place, similar in size to what we have now here at Our Savior. He had a lot to do, but yet every week he carved out time in his schedule to meet with me. He made himself available to me. And he took action. Not only was he a a pastor, he was the small group director of that church, so he took action by creating small groups. And he actually, the very first thing I did in ministry was I was a small group leader. He invited me to to dive into that and try that out. And that started everything that leads me to here today. Ultimately, Pastor Dan had an ability. A unique set of abilities that God had gifted him to care for me in that moment. He was the mentor I needed. And over the years, I had several mentors at Trinity Lutheran Church that ultimately led me to seminary. But Dan was first. But here's the punchline to that story. When I walked into his office that day and I said, I'm here to get involved... What I really meant was, I'm here to play tuba. Because the church had a brass ensemble that played once in a while on Sunday mornings. They didn't have a low brass player. Well, I can play tuba. I can do that. And that's honestly what I intended to do. I'll play brass. I have no intention of doing anything else. That'll be my contribution to the church, my service to the church. And the rest of me won't change. But Dan made an effort. And he availed himself, and he took all these actions, and he served me. And in that moment, when he presented all these options to me, when I was just there to play tuba, I had a choice. Do I let him care for me, or I say, no, I'm just here to play tuba? Do I allow him to care for me? And that's the question for all of us today. Can we receive service? Can we receive somebody else's abilities into our life? Because it's fundamentally hard for us to do. We are, we are human beings and our human nature and the culture around us teaches us to be independent and autonomous and to do it for ourselves and serve others. And quite often, weak, uh, weakness is seen as asking for help, for needing somebody else. Needing to be cared for is a sign of weakness to so many of us. And in this serving series, this serving challenge series we've been doing, I mean, we're, we're, it's, it's all about inspiring us to for greater and greater acts of service. And St. Paul in the New Testament quotes Jesus as saying, it is better to give than to receive. 
In the New Testament, it uses the word give twice as often as it uses the word receive. Over and over, our Lord Jesus, and over and over, the Bible makes it very clear that we are to strive towards acts of service for each other, using our abilities for each other. But there's a fundamental truth that the Bible does not overlook. It does not skip. No one, no one can use their abilities, or their abilities, unless there's somebody to receive them. If somebody's willing to receive somebody else's ability, it's not going to get used. Ability isn't just what we generously use to serve others. Ability is our willingness to be cared for as well. And yes, we can do that generously as well. And I see people struggle with this idea constantly. My, one of the main aspects of my day job here at the church is to do visitations. Certainly nursing homes, but also every day when we have a member in the hospital, I go up and I see that member in the hospital. Pastor Lee goes up and sees members of hospitals that are out of town, Omaha, Lincoln, that sort of thing. We have a, we have a hospitalization, hospitalized visitation team here that goes and visits people on the weekends. Going to the hospital is a rough place. No one goes there for vacation. You're there because you can't care for yourself and something's wrong and you need acute care, whether it's the ER or you get admitted to the hospital. And it's a rough place because for many of us, it's the first time we felt vulnerable. The first time we've been dependent on somebody else's care. And it's hard. And it's humbling. We spent so much of our life being autonomous, it's hard to receive somebody's care now. It's almost like so many of us, and little kids, kids here, you did this and you don't remember it. When we're two years old, we look at our parents and say, I can do it myself. Remember that? Parents, you remember that? Ellie, yes, you did it. I can do it myself. Little kids like to do that. It's a part of their growing process. But we spend decades with that attitude. We go from I can do it myself to I must do it myself. I cannot allow others to care for me. It's a sign of weakness to receive care. But like I said, nobody can use their ability unless somebody can receive it. Oftentimes when I stand here and I do the prayers of the church, when I go up and I sit with somebody in the hospital, I have the same kind of theme in mind. Think about it. Doctors and nurses and physical therapists up at the hospital, all the, the staff of the hospital who are so trained, gone through so much education, have so many abilities to care for medical scenarios that I cannot even imagine. It all goes to waste if no one's in the hospital to receive that care. There are times when we are called to serve using our abilities. And there are times we are called to be served as well. The two best people I have ever seen, as a pastor of this church, the two best people I have ever seen receive care at the hospital are Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave Kipp, and if you remember Jordan Miller, our former worship director, his late grandfather Norman, Norman Miller. These two men, they, they presented a master class when they were in the hospital of how to receive care. Both of them, it would have been years ago, they were both hospitalized for extended periods, but I'd go up and I'd see them every day, and I'd sit there and marvel at how every doctor, every nurse, every caregiver came in, would walk out of that room with a smile on their face and the war warmth of God in their hearts. Because Dave and Norm, they reflected the love of God they had in Jesus Christ to their caregiver as they received care. They received service generously. And like I say, it was a master class to watch. These two men receive. So as much as serving is godly, because Christ obviously models that for us, receiving is godly. And it's at the very core of our faith, in fact. That's actually what we, we heard today as Haley was reading our gospel reading, this, the famous story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Because in the story, it's, I mean, it's the night before Jesus is arrested. Tomorrow he'll be crucified. He gathers with his, his disciples in the upper room. This is where they share the Passover meal, the, the Holy Supper. This is where Jesus institutes Holy Communion. But before he does that, he gets down, he puts a towel around his waist, he fills up a bucket full of water, and he starts washing their feet. Dirty, stinky feet. The lowliest job of a servant in the household was to wash dirty feet. And Jesus models service by getting down on his knees and washing their feet. And he gets to Simon Peter, St. Peter. And what does Peter say? It's from John 13. 
no, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus. And Jesus answered, and I want everyone to hear this, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. How does Peter reply? Then Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Peter has no intention of being cared for. No intention of letting Jesus serve him. He lives in a culture, just not, it's not that much different than our culture, frankly. A culture of, I got to do it myself. And it's a sign of weakness, especially in the Roman culture of the first century. It was a sign of weakness to need somebody else's help. And Peter's not going to stand for it. No, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. I can do it myself. Peter's still a little two-year-old. But what does Jesus say? No, this is not, this is not my king, how my kingdom's going to go, Peter. All too often, I think we, we take these terms and we're thinking about how they apply as servants, but we don't think about how we receive these values. Because it's important to receive. I think that's the point I'm trying to drive at. And I think there's faulty ways where we mess up with those, those four activities. I brought a slide with me today. But how we miss these. Faulty availability, I don't want to be a burden. Oh, I've heard this so many times. I'll be standing out in the front greeting people. Somebody will come in. I just, had, I just got out of the hospital. Oh, I just had surgery this week. Why didn't you tell me I'd have come up and be with you? I'd have prayed with you. I'd have come up and visited you. Oh, I don't want to be a burden, Pastor. Maybe some of you have said that to me. I don't want to be a burden, Pastor. It's not a burden. God's called me to this job. He's called me to this place to care for people. I'm the visitation pastor. He's called Pastor Lee as a pastor of this church to the same thing. He's called every pastor in the country, in the world, across time and space to serve people. We have a hospitalized visitation team who goes on the weekends, like I said. They're equipped and they're looking for people to care for. It's not a burden. It's what God's called us to do. It's our ability. And yet we go, oh, I don't be available. Faulty attitude. I hear this one for people mainly outside of the church. No one can help me. Oh, I'm too far gone. I'm too broken. You can't help me. I can't be recovered. Faulty attitude. It's like we're, we, we're convinced that God couldn't possibly equip somebody with the ability to help me. Faulty action. This is the opposite of faulty avail availability, by the way. It's assuming people know what you need and not asking for it. It's why didn't you visit me in the hospital? I didn't know you were in the hospital. You got to tell me these things. It's asking for help when we need help, and it's hard for us to do. I mean, we have a lot of serving teams here at the church. We have divorce care, we have grief share, we have Forever in Our Hearts, which is a ministry to women who have suffered miscarriage and child loss. We have Stephen's ministry, John, back there, John Gary, one of our co-leaders of Stephen's ministry. It's a team trained to, to help people walk through crises and moments in their life. And all too often, these teams sit idle because people won't ask for help. God's equipped you to ask for help, and God's equipped people to help you. Ask, please. And lastly is faulty ability, feeling that I must do it myself. I cannot ask for help. I think that's Peter's problem here. Because Peter believes Jesus is his king, the king of the kingdom. And in that culture, and in cultures today, you serve the king. The king doesn't serve you. You serve the king. You prove your loyalty to the king by service. So Peter says, you're not washing my feet, Jesus. It's my job to wash yours. And what does Jesus say? You don't do this. You don't belong, Peter. You don't receive. Unless you allow me to serve you, Peter... You're missing the point. See, one verse earlier, verse 7, Jesus says the words, you do not realize what I am doing, but you will understand later. Jesus is washing the disciples' feet is but a metaphor for the cross. At the cross, Jesus washes us free of our sin problem. And our sin problem is just that. Sin is too often not willing to receive what God would have for us, not waiting for God to give us what we need rather than grabbing it for ourselves, trying to grab it for ourselves and hurting ourselves and others. But then God's law comes along and convicts us of our sin and tells us about the wonderful beauty that we have in Jesus Christ dying for our sin. And yet all too often we feel like we have to do something. We got to serve. We got to take some action to justify Jesus caring for us that much. That we got to contribute somehow. 
In human culture, and unfortunately, the history of the Christian church is filled with broken examples of us trying to partner with Jesus to save us. As if we're going, you know what, Jesus, I don't need you to wash me. I can do it myself. And then Jesus is warning to Peter as Jesus is warning to us. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And he's not talking about the soles of our shoes. He's talking about these soles. We've been broken by sin. But Jesus has freely gone to the cross to die. To wash us clean. And it is a free gift. We do nothing to earn it. All we can do is receive his ability to die for us. And we can respond. Respond joyously. Peter responds joyously. Jesus, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus, wash me clean. Peter gets it. He wants to be cared for. He wants to joyously receive what his friend and his Lord and his king has for him. So as much as our faith impels us towards service, as much as Jesus models that service for us, and as much as God, we know, will give us endless opportunities in life to use our abilities to grow in our faith, I invite you not to miss the fundamental truth. We are a part of Jesus because of what he has done for us, and we can only receive it. We receive it by faith. We say the Holy Spirit gives us faith. That's a good confirmation lesson. Faith is nothing more in the, than the ability to receive what God has for us. We receive God's grace and mercy through faith. We cannot earn it through our own actions. See, the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, we see the two fundamental truths. God has called us to service. Jesus serves as king. No one can say, well, I'm too important for that. Jesus, the king, serves. But at the same time, Peter receives and receives joyously what the king has done for him. Giving and receiving are both abilities that we can use and receive graciously in our Lord Jesus Christ. The last slide I want to put up today is a quote. And it's a quote by John Paul II, the former pope of the Catholic Church in the 80s and 90s. I, was, I, found, this, I found this quote, I thought it was just really good. Nobody is so poor that he has nothing to give, and nobody is so rich that he has nothing to receive. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God transcend your hearts and minds. Keep yourselves in Christ Jesus until the day he returns. Amen.